It's a great pleasure to welcome you and, especially, and also to welcome uh, Jim Lindsay uh, to this global currents discussion at uh, Case Western Reserve University in this, in this, this, this beautiful new uh, facility, the Tinkerville University Center. Uh, the global currents discussions uh, uh, financed by a nice grant from uh, Ms. Eloise Briskin and I'd like to thank, thank her for that. Um, I would also like to uh, emphasize that uh, there are a lot of global comments going on at the moment, and this, this particular topic of foreign policy in the United States election is, involves an intersection between global comments and domestic comments, and I don't know what happens when global comments and domestic comments inter you know, interact. Maybe you get a whirlpool, uh, maybe you get an eddy, maybe you get, an under maybe you get a riptide. I'm not sure exactly what is going on, um, but I can think of... I can actually think of nobody I would rather hear talk about this topic than, than Jim Lindsay. I've been fortunate enough to know Jim since we were graduate students together working on our dissertations at the Brookings Institution in the 1980s doing, doing interviews with congressional uh, defense policy experts. Um, some of my favorite uh, in interview stories are some of the things that, 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 that we both heard from people on the defense appropriations uh, subcommittees. Um, and since then, of course, I've been fortunate to follow his extremely distinguished career, um, both as, as a professor at the University of Iowa, as a, uh, um, you know, at the National Security Council, at the, uh, uh, as the Tom Slick Chair for International Affairs at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, where he was also the inaugural director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International, International Security and Law at the University of Texas, uh, and then at the Council of Foreign Relations, where he is currently uh, Senior Vice President, Director of Studies, and Morris R. Greenberg Chair. As I emphasized in the uh, blurb for this event, uh, what makes it particularly interesting to uh, hear from Jim is that uh, he combines understandings uh, both of deep understanding of foreign policy issues, deep understanding of the foreign policy making process in the United States. There are very few people who uh, have his kind of understanding of both the executive branch and congressional size, although we happen to have one person of that sort here in our department and Professor Catherine C. Lavelle, who I'm glad to see here. <laughs> no, 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 you don't need to stand up, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and also a deep understanding of electoral politics, although at the moment I'm not sure what it, what it would mean to understand American electoral politics. I'm, I'm looking at Professor Beckwith, who's an expert in American electoral politics, and she's like shaking her head. Uh, uh, but... Uh, the topic today is foreign policy in the United States election. That can be taken in many different directions, and I am very much looking forward to seeing uh, where Dr. Lindsay takes it. Thank you. I will have to say that uh, introductions are my favorite part of the talk. Uh, <laughs> from where I come, I'm ready to go home now. I, uh, I also wish I should get my mother and father to come to these things, because uh, I know my father would appreciate hearing all the nice things that are being said about me, and my mother would actually believe them. Uh, so that would be good. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here today. It's very exciting. It's a lovely facility. My goodness, uh, quite nice. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's better to be here in Cleveland today or whether I should be a bit remorseful, because I'm not here on Wednesday, because obviously there's a big event tomorrow, which uh, could ultimately decide the Republican nomination. And then you're only about 125 days out from uh, the Republican National Convention, which should in and of itself uh, be very interesting. So you guys all have uh, a front seat to one of the most interesting times uh, in American politics. As Joe said, the topic of my uh, talk is the uh, it's foreign policy in the 2016 election. I'm trying to moderate, modulate my voice so I don't blow out your eardrums. Uh, let me just sort of say up front a couple of things. Number one, I am not going to talk about 
different candidates all that much during my opening remarks. During question and answering, if you want to talk about specific candidates, we can do so. Uh, second, I should just put my cards on the table and tell you I'm not advising any political candidates, so I'm not here on behalf of any of the candidates in the race or any candidates who were in the race or any candidates who might still come into the race. So I just wanted to uh, put that uh, on the table. What I want to do, rather than sort of talking about uh, specific candidates, is sort of cast my net broadly. Uh, first, I want to talk about the current foreign policy challenges that the United States faces. And then I want to talk a little bit about how those challenges are being discussed or not being discussed on the campaign trail. Uh, now, I'm going to make three points on uh, each of those. Uh, but if I were to summarize my overall message to you in a single word, it would be the word adrift. As I look at American foreign policy, as I look at the world, the word of orders established more than 70 years ago is fraying. It's fraying very badly in some places, uh, but our political debate here at home hardly recognizes that fact, let alone is devising a response to it. But let me begin sort of by talking about the context of American foreign policy or American foreign policy challenges. I'll give my first point. Point number one, uh, we live as Americans in an enviable time and we occupy an enviable position. Now I say that because every morning that I pick up uh, the newspaper, the news headlines suggest that we live in the most dangerous of times. And certainly there are a lot of people who make just that argument. Uh, I think that's hardly true. Yes, uh, the post-Cold War era has not lived up to its uh, most utopian promises. Uh, but I hate to break it, this is a far safer world uh, than the one that preceded it. Uh, for those of you who are younger, we have some younger people in the audience, uh, I would note that uh, if you think back during the Cold War, we came perilously close to extinguishing the human race. Uh, the threat of nuclear extinction has receded and great power rivalries, while not dead, are substantially muted. Now, I also said that I think the United States occupies an enviable position. Why do I say that? Uh, certainly to judge when you turn on cable news, uh, there's a lot of commentary on the campaign trail, most of it along the lines of America has been doing a lot of losing lately. Uh, but I guess I would ask you all to think the following question. Uh, would you trade the current position of the United States for that of any other major power. Think about China. Economic growth in China has slowed sharply as the country struggles to switch from an export-led economy to one in which growth is led by internal consumption. This is a big problem for a government whose sole pillar of legitimacy is on its ability to deliver economic growth and that economic growth is going away. China's population is aging. China is going to be the first country to get old uh, before it becomes rich. And for those of you who have seen many of the photos on TV, China has a significant problem with environmental crises. Uh, its air, its people cannot breathe. Its water, its people cannot drink. And there's a great deal of contamination of soil in China. Let's switch from China and go to Russia. Uh, Russia's population uh, actually started to grow in the last couple of years, but its long-term trend is downward. Uh, its economy is, rests on a very, very thin foundation, namely the price of oil. And when the price of oil dips below $50 a barrel, as it has, uh, may stay there quite a while, clearly creates problems with Russia. Or think of Europe. A decade ago, a book was written with the title, Why the European Union will lead the 21st century. A decade later, that seems to be an odd claim to have made. Uh, Europe is in a prolonged bout of economic stagnation. Uh, many Europeans are increasingly questioning uh, the future or direction of the European Union. We have the issue of Brexit. Many of the new European Union members uh, want to renegotiate the terms of the deal. And obviously, Europe is struggling uh, with an aging population and a very substantial refugee crisis. I could multiply those arguments out whether we talk about Brazil, or we talk about India, or we talk about Indonesia, or any other major country you may think of. 
in the end, the United States doesn't look so bad. Indeed, I would say if the U.S. were a stock, it would be a more attractive buy uh, than any of its other competitors. Point number two. As good as things are, there are things to worry about. Some of you are probably already thinking about that old joke about the gentleman who goes to the top of the Empire State Building, jumps off, passes by the th 43rd floor, somebody shouts out, how's it going? He gets two thumbs up and says, so far, so good. Okay. Yes, we are in an enviable position, but that doesn't mean that things can't get bad. And let me sort of point you to two things. One, trends, and the other what I'll call wild cards. Trends are things that we know are going to happen because they're in motion. Three trends are worth keeping an eye on. One is the movement of economic and political power away from the West to the rest of the world. That actually hasn't been by accident. It is partly the consequence of a very deliberate American policy dating back to the end of World War II to construct a liberal economic order whose idea was that everybody could enter and we could all be better off. But it has had consequences. Second trend is a democratization of violence. It used to be that governments controlled the monopoly on violence. That is less and less the case around the world. That is, it's becoming easier and easier for people who do not belong to governments to get the means of violence and to be able to apply them. And that is a significant trend. Because again, in part, let's keep in mind, we have something known as the internet. And you can go to Mr. Google, you'd be surprised the number of things you can discover about how to build uh, weapons of mass destruction. Third trend to keep in mind is uh, what is very clearly the erosion or the collapse of existing state structures. We see this most notably in the Middle East. My boss, Richard Haas of the Council on Foreign Relations, has talked about the so-called unraveling uh, in the Middle East and has likened it to the 30 years war in Europe uh, in the middle of the uh, 16th century, uh, 17th century, I guess. And, uh, but it's not just in the Middle East. If you look across Africa, yes, there are places in Africa that are uh, showing great success, uh, but many uh, states in Africa are not quite failing, but not succeeding. There are large numbers of ungoverned spaces that are being filled by people who do not have good intentions. That's trends. What about wild cards? I can run through some of them easily. We often worry about a strong China. It's dangerous, might be a weak China. What happens if China is unable to grow, is unable to satisfy uh, the demands of its people? What behavior does that lead to? What if we do see an unraveling of the European Union, this most successful of supranational organizations? We tend to think that because countries have come together, they will always stay together. They need not. Uh, and even if the European Union does not implode, but is simply incapable of acting, what are the consequences for global politics? We have the issue of the challenge Russia is posing uh, to the international order. Uh, what exactly is Mr. Putin's uh, end game or his strategy? And then we get to issues like nuclear terrorism. What would happen if somebody succeeded in stealing a nuclear weapon and detonating it uh, in a major city? Catastrophic climate change. Much of the debate about climate change presumes that it will unfold slowly, giving us time to adapt and mitigate. It's also quite possible that we could see changes that would happen quite quickly and be almost impossible, if not impossible, uh, to deal with. Likewise, we have the issue of infectious diseases. I have the great pleasure of working with one of the uh, most prominent people working in the issue area of uh, infectious diseases, a woman named uh, Lori Garrett, who won a Pulitzer Prize uh, with the reporting on uh, Ebola and other uh, infectious diseases more than two decades ago. And she's introduced me to a lot of biological scientists who sort of tell, virologists who tell me how easy it is for certain common viruses we have today to morph into being something quite lethal and very difficult to deal with. So there are issues to worry about. But the broad picture, I would say, is that when you look around, the terrain of international politics is and has been changing. Uh, the institutions and boundaries drawn up after the end of World War II are definitely showing their age. Uh, too many of our uh, intergovernmental organizations uh, don't work. Uh, very clearly, large numbers of countries feel they are shut out of those institutions and do not have a voice. 
Our traditional partners, think Europe, think Japan, are fo uh, focused primarily inward, worrying about their own domestic problems far less than what's happening beyond our borders. Uh, we have potential new partners, think Brazil, think India, think South Africa, all democracies, but they aren't looking to deepening ties with us. Uh, they're much, very much focused on working with Russia and China to construct new institutions that will provide a countervailing weight to existing institutions. Point number three, in global politics as in life, those who adapt best win. Yes, the United States faces a lot of short-term questions, see them all in the news. What do you do about the Islamic State? How do you counter Chinese island building in the South China Sea? How do you deter Russian aggression in Ukraine? How do you stop Iran's nuclear program? How do you stop North Korea's nuclear program? Should you enact a Trans-Pacific partnership? How do you present cyber war? Whoever becomes president next at noon on uh, next January 20th is going to have a lot of immediate must-do issues in his or her inbox. Uh, but the focus on the near term can obscure, obscure the importance of anticipating and preparing for longer term challenges. Now here I'm going to use a sports metaphor. Okay, I apologize for that, but I grew up watching ESPN, so I tend to think in sports metaphors. Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, was once asked why he was such a great hockey player. And his answer was as follows. I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck will be. And that's really a metaphor for success in life, is skating to where the puck ought to be. Great states people, statesmen, stateswomen, are remembered because they were able to anticipate and identify the future and move their countries toward that destination, whether their countries wanted to go there uh, or not. And I think really for all of us, it's worth remembering that if you do not know your destination, any road will take you there. But you may not like where you end up. So I really think the meta, meta challenge for the United States is how to make sense of the way the world is changing and what changes are required of us. In a world where America's advantage over others shrinks, because they are getting wealthier, the rest is catching up with the West, where should the United States place its strategic bets? What can the United States influence and what is worth influencing? Who does the United States need as partners? And how does it best persuade them to cooperate? And here I will uh, invoke a quote. I think when you give a talk, you're always required to quote somebody famous who's not a sports figure. So I will do that right here. And I will uh, use a quote. It's attributed almost certainly apocryphal, apocryphally to Charles Darwin, but it's been hung on him, and it's this. It is not the strongest species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. And I think the real question for the United States, can America recognize the need to change? And does it know how to change? Now, easier said than done. Let me flip that now and talk about the 2016 campaign. Okay, I said I would talk, make three points uh, on the campaign, I will do that. Point number one, foreign policy doesn't drive how the public votes. This is not a foreign policy election. Now I will say that every four years I get phone calls from eager journalists who are sitting down to write a news piece arguing that this is the year that we're going to get a foreign policy election. And every four years, they are disappointed. Because uh, I think foreign policy elections are what I might call the white whale of American politics. Okay, Often spoken of, very seldom seen. And again, I don't think it's anything different in the current electoral cycle. Now, we had the Paris attacks last November followed by the San Bernardino shootings. Uh, and that certainly generated a lot of stories about how this really was going to be the time of a foreign policy election. And it's certainly true that foreign policy, and let me put that in quotes, I'll come back to it in a second. It is clear that foreign policy shot up the list of uh, issues that worried voters. Certainly you can see that in lots of polls. And a lot of journalists uh, wrote a lot of column inches about that. But that commentary misses three important things that I will point to. 
Number one, there are intense partisan differences when it comes to foreign policy. Republicans are far, far more inclined uh, to cite some foreign policy issue as important to their vote as Democrats are. Generally speaking, it depends upon the poll, uh, what time the poll is done, but you're finding roughly maybe one out of 10, two out of 10 Democrats will point to something, anything that looks like a foreign policy issue and say, that matters to my vote. If you look at Republicans, you can find probably three, three and a half out of 10 uh, doing the same thing. Second point worth keeping in mind about where the public is on foreign policy is that even among Republican voters who are the most concerned about national security or foreign policy issues, domestic issues, Trump foreign policy. And when I say that I'm even being generous in how I define foreign policy, I'm including immigration. Okay, so it's not the case. Even though Republicans are more worried about foreign policy issues, it doesn't mean that Republicans are more worried about foreign policy issues than about domestic issues. Third thing that I want to say, and this is, gets back to my quotation marks, uh, when you look at what the public is worried about, it is worried about primarily, overwhelmingly about terrorism. That's where the conversation begins with the public, and that's essentially where it ends. China, Russian aggression, North Korea's nuclear program, Iran's nuclear program, the Eurozone crisis, climate change, infectious disease, all the things that have people in my business uh, writing hundreds and thousands of words uh, with solutions and concerns, they haven't broken into the public's consciousness. Indeed, if you go look at the Gallup uh, poll, which I think monthly does its uh, what is the most important problem facing the country, you'll generally find that foreign policy will register 1%, 2%, 3% overall. Okay? People are focused on terrorism. Uh, they're not focused on foreign policy writ large. Now, of course, none of this is terribly surprising. This is the way the American public uh, long has been. The public is, not surprisingly, worried about the problems that are immediate to them uh, that concern them. Second point I want to make about the campaign is that the candidates themselves also really haven't uh, focused on foreign policy. Like the public, uh, much of discussion on the campaign trail, and this is particularly true on the GOP side, uh, has been to talk about terrorism to the exclusion of most other issues. Again, I think it's quite clear. I think anyone uh, tunes in any one of the many Republican debates, uh, the terrorism uh, figures quite prominently. Uh, if you watch your Democratic debates, it comes up as well, not as often. Again, not surprising given where uh, the voters on both sides uh, of the partisan aisle are. Now, if you look at the Republican debate, uh, the discussion has been very long on criticism uh, of Obama's alleged weakness. Uh, the argument being that if Obama had been stronger, these problems uh, would not exist. Uh, but while the Republican uh, debates have been long on criticism, they've been very short uh, on policy solutions. And one of the most interesting things is despite all the invective, if you look at the, can uh, look at the solutions the candidates are offering, and here I'll even throw in uh, the Democratic candidates, things like when we talk about terrorism or uh, ISIS, intensified airstrikes, more special operations forces, uh, getting our friends and allies in the region to do more. These are all things that the Obama administration is already doing. So there's a disconnect between the criticism and the policy prescription. Once you move beyond terrorism, uh, it's hard to see the candidates uh, paying much heed to other major foreign policy issues. Yes, we've had Iran. Iran has uh, come up uh, fairly frequently, uh, particularly on the Republican side. And critics of the Iran deal have focused on uh, who is going to be the quickest to tear it up uh, and tear it up most dramatically without showing why that would work uh, or how our allies would react and why that would be tolerable or why that wouldn't allow the Iranians to pursue their nuclear program uh, unconstrained. Uh, likewise, trade in the last week or so has all of a sudden uh, gained new purchase uh, in the debate. But the discussion there has mostly been table pounding that trade agreements have been a bad deal for the United States. 
uh, a debatable empirical claim, uh, but not about what a good deal might look like uh, or how the U.S. economy can succeed in an increasingly competitive global economy. That is long on uh, complaint, very short uh, on policy prescription. And if you go back and look at all the Republican uh, presidential debates and the uh, Democratic presidential debates, I've actually, I think I've seen all but one of them. But one I didn't see was because I was on an airplane to South Africa, so I couldn't keep my streak going alive. Uh, but very little about North Korea. Very little about climate change. Very little about cyber war. What we would do about island building by the Chinese in the South China Sea. Even beyond that, there's been no serious engagement with what I referred to before as sort of the meta challenges uh, facing the United States. What does China's rise mean for the United States? Uh, as you look around the Middle East and Africa and seeing governments fray, if not collapse, what can the United States do? What should it do? Why should we believe it should work? Even more importantly, you know, who are our partners and how do you convince them uh, to work with us? Uh, and much of the conversation is almost routinized invocation of the idea America must lead without considering who wants to be lead, who wants to be led, uh, and where exactly we are leading them to. Indeed, I would say characterizing the debate overall on the Republican side as well as the Democratic side, uh, the debate has largely been stale and backward looking. Uh, again, lots of talk about leadership uh, without necessarily identifying who's ready to follow and to what end. And I will simply tell you, as someone who spends a fair amount of time traveling around the world, I would not operate from the assumption that other countries are necessarily looking to the United States uh, to lead them. Point number three, this is a problem. Okay, Why is the fact that the foreign policy debate is stale and backward looking a problem? Now, I had had the pleasure of working uh, at the White House, and I spent a lot of my adult life looking at and thinking about foreign policy problems. And so I would be the first to admit that sometimes uh, ignoring foreign policy may actually be a good thing. Okay? Uh, numerous presidents uh, have had to walk back promises that drew applause on the campaign trail that were entirely unworkable uh, once they're in the Oval Office. Bill Clinton, as candidate, opposed the North American Free Trade Agreement and permanent uh, trade relations with China. Uh, President Bill Clinton uh, championed passage of both. Uh, George W. Bush famously said he was going to give us a humble foreign policy and would avoid nation building. Uh, after September 11th, we saw something quite different. Barack Obama, uh, I think to many of his campaign supporters in 2008, would have been surprised to find at the end of his uh, eight years that uh, Guantanamo Bay is still open, that he escalated the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, and uh, unseated Muammar Gaddafi. So what's said in the campaign trail may not necessarily be what presidents do were in the White House. Uh, nor do I want to suggest that somehow there was this idyllic past where presidential candidates sat down almost like it were an academic conference and politely exchange views on foreign policy. Okay? Politics has always been a rough and tumble sport, uh, no doubt about that, and with candidates often distorting facts, oversimplifying arguments, and twisting, came, uh, twisting claims to advance their cause. But I do think in this case, if you look at uh, 2016, uh, the failure of candidates, again, in both parties, uh, to grapple seriously with the foreign policy challenges the United States faces is shortchanging both themselves and the country. Themselves because I think it's actually useful for uh, presidential candidates to begin to think through some of the big issues they are going to grapple with. Because somebody out of this pool of candidates is going to be president starting noon next January 20th. Uh, and that inbox is going to be very full. And the American political system gives pre winning presidential candidates very little time actually to get up to speed. Not only do they have to get up to speed on the issues, they actually have to staff a whole administration, which is actually a very, very difficult thing to do. But I think campaigns are also uh, an opportunity to have a conversation with the country uh, about the tasks it, it faces and the choice it, it must make. And I think not having that conversation uh, makes it hard to build a consensus. And I think that 
failure to build a consensus or to try to build a consensus is all the more troubling because the United States is not, at the end of the day, another country or just another country. We have a greater capacity and greater opportunity than anyone else around the world to influence global events. As a result, our failures are felt not just here at home, but all around the world. And if any of you get the chance to go around uh, to world capitals, you'll hear people say just that. We have the one presidential election that is followed by everybody around the world because everybody feels they have a stake in the choices that Americans make. Let me close there. I hope I have not spoken too long, uh, nor have I said too little. And we can talk about whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Is this, is this on? It's on now. It's on now. Okay, well, thank you very much for setting the stage so nicely. And um, uh, what we're going to do is ask people if they want to ask questions uh, to uh, speak into this microphone, which means I need to bring you the microphone, or Mr. Digby needs to bring you the microphone. And it looks like Professor Hockenstad will lead off. And if people won't ask me questions, I'll ask you questions, because you all get to vote tomorrow. <laughs> I've just finished reading the book, Winter is Coming. Okay. And it left me with quite a bit of anxiety to know that Vladimir Putin has his thumb on the second largest atomic commerce arsenal in, in the world. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about our relationships with Russia and uh, Russia under Putin, which has become more and more of a dictatorship? and is clearly chipping away at the uh, boundaries of, of that uh, country. One other thing I would say is that in my earlier trips to Russia, uh, my Russian colleagues were very willing to criticize Yeltsin as much as possible. You don't hear a word about Putin from them. Excellent question, excellent observation. Uh, let me say, if we were to go back well, now it's almost 25 years, uh, to the fall of the Soviet Union and the sort of birth of modern Russia, uh, certainly for most Americans had great hopes that we could reset the nature of U.S.-Russian relations. And I think it is safe to say that a quarter century later, uh, that hope has not been fulfilled. Uh, and it is both a challenge for the United States but also possibly an opportunity. And, and here's the problem that the United States faces, which is that Mr. Putin uh, has subverted democracy, whatever democracy there was uh, in Russia. Uh, you are quite right that it is uh, a very personalist rule with very few people willing to speak out. He has managed to uh, both whip up nationalist fervor uh, and to close down uh, any sort of opposition. I was in Russia last summer. I've had the pleasure of going to Russia a number of times now. My experience was quite like yours. Uh, you would get very lively debates. They were quite happy to say what they didn't like about what the U.S. was doing, and, but they were quite as eager to say what they didn't like about what uh, their own presidents were doing. And I would say when I was in Moscow last summer, what I heard, and I met with other people who would have been, what we would consider sort of part of uh, sort of the liberal elite of Russia. Number one, many of them didn't want to talk to us because they felt that talking to us would just get them in trouble. Uh, when we, those we did speak to, I would describe as being very despondent about uh, the future course of Russia. And one of the things that I heard over and over again, I also heard this in Eastern Europe, is that Russia as it currently exists is different than the Soviet Union. That in the Soviet Union, it was true it was not a democracy. The public was not heard. Commands were made at the top and sent down, and people were expected to obey them. But that certainly under, whether it was Khrushchev, followed by Brezhnev, uh, and others, you really did have collective decision making. No one person really ran the show or had run the show since Stalin. And what I heard, and what I think is troubling, is that people feel is that in Russia there is Mr. Putin, and that's where it ends, that there are no checks. It's a very much more personalized sense of rule. And that obviously has great dangers, uh, because the only check, if that's true, 
uh, on Mr. Putin is Mr. Putin. Obviously, with the annexation of Crimea, uh, relations between Washington and Moscow have clearly uh, turned cold. Uh, the United States' response has been, along with the Europeans, to sanction the Russians, uh, leading Russian figures. Uh, those sanctions probably have had some bite on the Russian economy. They have not changed Russian behavior. Uh, and again, as uh, people who know a lot more about Russia than I do uh, point out to you, whenever we talk about inflicting pain on the Russians, they say this is a country that survived Leningrad and Stalingrad, uh, cutting down their ability to get apples or flowers from the Netherlands is not going uh, to change the conversation. The, the challenge, though, for the United States, if, if it were just a matter of signaling our displeasure with the Russians, it would be a very easy conversation to have. The problem is in a number of issues, the United States needs Russia's cooperation. And I think this is, one of the, this is one of the challenges we face as a country. How do you construct a foreign policy in which some of the people you're opposed to are also the people you need something from. Oftentimes, American foreign policy uh, bends to the moralistic. We put people in the good category, or we put them in the bad category, with the Russians quite clearly being in the bad category. How do you navigate that challenge where if you say to Mr. Putin, I'm going to punish you here because I don't like what you did in Crimea or what you did in Ukraine, but what if you need his cooperation in Syria? What if you need his cooperation to conduct what you're trying to do in Afghanistan? That's a very tough balance to make. Because again, as president, you know, if you could sort of do things in private, it would be one thing. But everything you do is in public. And obviously, uh, if you are seen as being too sympathetic to Mr. Putin, you're going to attract an awful lot of criticism for what you're doing. Uh, and I think that's one of the big challenges. And again, as I look at the campaign, I haven't seen any candidate talk in a serious way about what the policy choices are they are going to make. Okay? And they are tough ones because what the Russians are doing in Ukraine is wrong. And it is harmful. And people are dying because of it. But again, you also need Russian cooperation on Syria. You need Russian cooperation on Iran. You'll also probably want Russian cooperation on North Korea. Now, in the end, most likely what you hope is that your president is going to be able to sort of do a little bit of each, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Work with the Russians where you can, oppose them where you must. But that's going to be a very, very hard uh, road to walk uh, because one of the things, obviously, to worry about is doing anything that would embolden Mr. Putin. I mean, one of the most troubling things, one thing that sort of I worry about is as you see the aggressiveness with which Russians have resumed uh, what would have been Cold War style drills in patrols. Uh, I've been, you know, when I was in uh, the Balkans, not the Balkans, the Baltics uh, last summer, uh, they were greatly concerned about their air defenses being tested by Russian planes, a number of American uh, military exercises, and followed closely by uh, Russian. Uh, planes and what have you. Now, all of that, you know, there's a bit of brinksmanship. We saw it in the Cold War. Uh, nothing came of it, but something can come of it. And we see this most notably not with the United States, uh, but with Turkey, you know, where the Russians uh, have been buzzing the Turkish uh, border across. The Turks shot a plane down, uh, and that has really intensified uh, or plunged Turkish uh, Russian relations into. Uh, a cold place. But let's keep in mind, Turkey's not just another country. Turkey is a NATO ally. We have an obligation to our NATO allies uh, should they come under attack. So that is, a, that is not a, an inconsequential development. So the kind of high stakes that Mr. Putin is playing, uh, which maybe I, I can't explain him, always one of the, the great questions is why, what his, uh, his ultimate game plan, what is the strategy? I don't know what it is, uh, but obviously it has ratcheted up tensions uh, in which inadvertent escalation is not unthinkable in the way it once was. So my next question was about Turkey and um, what's going on there, and it's very uh, kind of along the same lines as Putin. 
and um, what does a policy uh, person like yourself think in terms of the ability for the current administration in, in Turkey to take that country further down the path away from democracy? Uh, the, I'm not a Turkish expert, so if there's anyone here who is a, 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 an expert on Turkish politics, sure let me apologize right. profusely to you. Uh, but the question was asked of me, so I will try to answer it. I mean, there are, there are two worrisome things about Turkey. One is the choices the Turkish government is making. And the second is what is happening around Turkey. I mean, if you are, if you are a Turk, uh, one of your problems is, is you now live in, in a very unstable neighborhood. But let's first talk about the choices the Turkish government is making. Uh, Erdogan, formerly the prime minister, now the president, uh, has been seeking to revise the constitutional system in Turkey to move to more, uh, let's call it American or French style presidential system uh, and away from a parliamentary system. And his vision is that he will be, or well, he is the president, but he will inherit these new powers. And in doing that, he quite clearly has targeted the opposition, uh, tried to squelch it. And he has also uh, either picked a fight with or not let a chance to, to have a fight with uh, Turkish Kurds pass by. And I do think if you look at Turkey, there are a lot of people who are concerned about the direction Turkey is going. Uh, a number of Turks, I'm just at a, a US-Turkey dialogue, uh, would point out that uh, it's very easy to exaggerate uh, the harm Mr. Erdogan is doing or will do arguing that even within his own party, there are people who are opposed uh, to his plans uh, and that are counseling a different cause. That said, if you look at Turkey, again, it sits next door to Syria, uh, which is, by any stretch of the imagination, a horrible place to be. More than half the country's population has been displaced. Uh, many of those people have come across the border into Turkey, uh, on their way elsewhere. Uh, Turkey is now under tremendous pressure from the Europeans uh, not to let people cross the border into Europe. They're going to pay uh, Turkey apparently somewhere on the order of 3 billion euros to do that. There's a very real question as to whether Turkey can, uh, even if it wants to halt the flow of refugees uh, because of what has happened in Syria. Whether that happens or doesn't happen will depend in good part on whether this agreement worked out really between the United States and Russia to get a, what I would call uh, an unfair, unjust, but uh, less bloody ceasefire uh, actually works. Uh, but that's not likely, uh, we'll be lucky if that happens. At the same time, what you have is the countries of the Middle East, in some sense, are artificial creations drawn up by cartographers after, during, after World War I. Uh, they don't have necessarily any internal logic other than the fact that they exist. And they have been under great stress uh, in recent years. And it's not clear they're going to be put back together. And again, this is another challenge for the United States. As you look at the Middle East, if my boss is right uh, about the unraveling of the Middle East, it is not at all clear the United States can put it back together again. But the question is, if you can't put it back together again, should you try to hold it together in its broken bits and parts, or do you welcome its dissolution? If you welcome your dissolution, how exactly do you do that? One of the big questions right now will be, what if the Iraqi Kurds declare independence and leave Iraq? Not out of the realm of possibility. Though given that oil prices have plummeted, uh, Iraqi Kurds would be less likely to leave than they would have otherwise if, if oil prices were higher. But obviously, if Iraqi Kurds were to declare their independence, that has significant implications for Iraq. It has significant implications for Iran, for Syria, and for Turkey, because Kurds live in all of those countries. Uh, and so that is going to be a very considerable challenge. And it will pit, for any American president, uh, of values that Americans hold dear, notions like self-determination, uh, against their uh, real politic uh, calculations. What do you owe the Turks uh, as an ally? What are the consequences if you uh, actually encourage or accede to uh, the creation of even just an Iraqi Kurdistan? These are all tough questions that don't have obvious solutions. 
I mean, we can sit around and argue how it would all play out. Uh, I can tell you a, an optimistic story, or if you want me to, I can tell you a very pessimistic story. And that's what makes it so tough. I can hear you. I don't know if you're on the microphone, but I can hear you. Okay. Um, you seem to imply earlier some criticism of the Obama administration, and I'm wondering if there's any consensus as to what realistically the administration could have done or should have done. And I'm not talking about red lines and bombing Syria. Uh, several observations. Number one, no presidential administration gets everything right in foreign policy. It's simply too difficult, too complicated. Uh, there are too many opportunities for things to go wrong, and too many people trying to subvert what you're going to do. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, you know, as to whether the president you know, scores as one of the more successful foreign policy presidents or one of the least successful foreign policy presidents is all going to turn on your assessment of what was, in fact, doable. My friends who are critics of the Obama administration would argue that the president has not uh, exercised American leadership in a convincing way. He's been too willing to let problems develop as opposed to stepping in early and making things happen. I will note uh, that they will argue that uh, the administration should have been uh, far more proactive on Syria, that if the administration had acted uh, aggressively early on, we would have avoided the situation we now have, which has rippled far beyond the borders of Syria and is putting tremendous strain on Europe and the European Union. Just look at the uh, re election results yesterday in Germany, uh, which are in many ways a rebuke to uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, conversely, you know, supporters of the Obama administration would argue that the ability of the United States to do anything substantial in Syria uh, is exaggerated. Uh, that if we had, and I think this is the administration's calculation, had intervened in Syria, uh, we simply would have made ourselves part of the problem and not necessarily solved anything. And I think, you know, someone like, likes to point out that in Iraq, the United States invaded and occupied and got a bad outcome. In Libya, the United States intervened but didn't occupy and got a bad outcome. In Syria, the United States neither intervened nor occupied and got a bad outcome. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, I'll let you sort of pick among those diagnoses. It's not as if it's uh, incontrovertible, incontrovertible about what could have happened. I would say that whether you favored earlier intervention in Syria or not, uh, I do think the administration uh, can be faulted for one, being very slow on the diplomatic front to do something to try to bring a halt to the fighting when it was clear that uh, uh, President Assad wasn't going to go. My best read is the administration thought early on that Assad was going to be swept out. Uh, they didn't envision going down the road uh, that they ended up going down. And I think the second thing is that the administration, in many ways, in terms of domestic politics, lost control of the narrative uh, on, and in part because of the rise of the Islamic State, where the president had sort of poo-pooed uh, the threat, and then we were faced with a much more serious uh, threat. I think, I think a threat even bigger than uh, even my hawkish friends uh, ever imagined. There weren't many who back in 2011, 2012, predicting the rise of the Islamic State. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether it, it, it might not be better for, uh, for, for the, the, the United States rather than uh, that, that, that all of this intervention um, and and choosing a side to to be on in in each uh, conflict um, to to wouldn't it be better to 
to try to bring the two parties together in, in each case so that the, the two parties could, could broker a deal, so, sort of like what, what Clinton did with, uh, with Yasser Arafat and, and Ehud Barak. That is a wonderful question, and I'll point out the following, which is it is possible to be an honest broker if the parties want you to be an honest broker. And quite often, they don't want you to be an honest broker. I mean, for example, uh, it's very easy sitting in Washington, D.C. to say, you know what? The Indians and the Pakistanis should find a way to bury the hatchet. Okay, they both have nuclear weapons. They have these outstanding border issues. Uh, we should just sort of sit down and have them talk to each other, you know, in, in a negotiation of good faith to sort of settle the issues once and for all. And what you will discover is, if you mention this to an Indian, they will say, who are you to say that you should come and help us solve our problem? If you talk to the Pakistanis, the reaction will be, see, we knew it all along. You really like the Indians better than us, and you're out to subvert us and attack us. So that's always, and that's always part of the problem. I think for Americans, it's sometimes hard to understand that other governments don't necessarily assume that you are this neutral arbiter that's going to solve things. I'll give you an example. Uh, but 10 days ago, I was in South Africa, a meeting with South African government officials. And what was very striking to me is they talked about their foreign policy, where they just sort of understand sort of how South Africa sees the world. Uh, what they frequently talked about was their partnerships and friendships with Russia and China. And we heard a lot of complaints about American foreign policy. Okay, now, you might wonder, why is a government that's democratic, South Africa, seeing its future lying in working with China and Russia to build new institutions to basically be a countervailing weight against the United States? Because they read history quite differently, as was explained to me, for many South Africans. While they may like Americans and want to buy American products, uh, at least for many of them, particularly in the government. Uh, America was on the wrong side of history. It took a long time to come around and be against apartheid. For many people in the government, in the ANC, educated in Russia or China, felt that during the struggle they got support from, I heard it over and over again, Cuba, Russia, China. And so I think part of it is it, it, we have to resist the temptation that people naturally assume uh, that we're going, that we should be their partner. Because in many cases, they don't. And there's also, I think it's safe to say in many countries, I think it's most notably when I get to, I've been to Brazil, uh, a sense of irritation that the United States spends insufficient time thinking about them. And that the United States is not looking to build a partnership with them. When I was in Indonesia, I heard lots of complaints uh, that they had thought uh, that the United States under President Obama, someone who lived in Indonesia, when as a young man, would be uh, elevating Indonesia up the list of priorities in American foreign policy. And they felt disappointed that that didn't happen. So uh, I, was, I would, while I may have come across as uh, criticizing this administration, I probably come across criticizing most administrations, it's actually very hard to match up all of these competing pressures. Uh, it's a very, very big challenge. The broader issue touch upon, would they decisively better off simply staying out? And that's, a, that's a big question. And I would have thought we may even had the potential in 2016 to have that conversation. You know, in essence, where does it make sense to try to extend American influence where it doesn't? Uh, one of the candidates that offered the, uh, that sort of vision was Rand Paul. Indeed, if you go back 18 months, 24 months, uh, you know, all those political reporters are already churning out their campaign copy. Uh, we're talking about how Rand Paul was the, 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 the favorite to win the nomination. I think we, Time Magazine in October of 2014 named him the most interesting uh, man in politics. I think even in December of 2014, the, the uh, gentleman who did the politics page for the Washington Post had him as the number one uh, most likely candidate to win. Uh, 
in his campaign. I think as soon as the Post pundits offered him up, uh, started not to, to do terribly well. And one of the interesting things is that Mr. Paul, Senator Paul, sort of ran away from the things that uh, he had talked about before. So he never really had uh, that kind of conversation, uh, certainly not on the Republican side that we thought we might have at one point. I just want to comment before I hand the uh, microphone to Professor Moore uh, that we seem to have enough trouble getting uh, the two sides to talk to each other in the United States, never mind in foreign policy situations. But. So I wanted to pick up on that point you made about Syria to ask a question, which is that, so you said that the United States didn't occupy Syria and we didn't intervene and still the administration got the civil war. So it's really two different questions. One question is the extent to which U.S. policy in the region might or might not have contributed to the civil war. But the other question that I'm interested in is what counts as intervention from a Washington perspective? Because if I'm sitting in Damascus and I see a hot civil war get kicked off on my border, I could consider that a form of intervention. But even more specifically, we now know, it's not, it's not a secret, that the United States, through its allies, the Emiratis and the Saudis, were, site, were sending weapons through Syria and through our ally Turkey very early on. That, to me, would sound like a form of intervention. So I'm just wondering, from the Washington perspective, what counts as intervention? Well, I, I don't want to speak for the Washington Convention since a lot of other people in Washington, I assume a few of them would disagree with me, so I won't say that. But I, the, the underlying premise of your question, I think, is spot on. There are, intervention is not just about sending uh, US military forces on the ground, arming uh, proxies and what have you. I mean, I think you know, going back to uh, President Assad, or even thinking about uh, Colonel Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, the notion, and there's sort of a, a competing priority there. Th these were not nice people. They were not running nice regimes. And it looked as if people were rising up to throw out the autocrat. And I do think that for most Americans, the notion of people rising up and throwing out an autocrat is a good thing. Uh, and I would say, uh, for a lot of Americans, helping, a, helping people do that is also a good thing. The problem we have, we have generally had is that when autocrats have gone, uh, is we have not necessarily been able to see that what succeeds them is better. And the track record actually is fairly dismal. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember uh, the late 1970s with Iran. And in a case in which Jimmy Carter, uh, under a lot of criticism, did not intervene uh, to keep the Shah on the throne. And the argument uh, I know from many people as, as the Shah went out was, well, it can't get any worse. And it did. Uh, I think for the administration, I think I, think I would describe President Obama as being less inclined uh, to want to intervene, certainly overtly, uh, with US military force than his predecessor. Did not want to intervene in Libya. But think of the situation that he was in. He was against doing so. He was being uh, lobbied by two of America's closest allies, Britain and France, to do something about it. Uh, you had Mr. Gaddafi moving troops toward Benghazi, talking about how he was going uh, to exterminate the rats in the city. Uh, we can flash back 15 years before that when the United States did nothing with the genocide in Rwanda. And it's not hard to understand why the administration would come down uh, on the side of, we need to do something. And they did. And we can fault the administration and say they failed on the follow through. They didn't think about what would come you know, after uh, Muammar Gaddafi uh, in Libya. And I think there's an element of truth to that. But quite honestly, I can't say that if the United States has done everything right, had made Libya the number one priority, that Libya would have worked out significantly differently than it has. Uh, and again, because we're not, we're not the only ones playing in the drama. And clearly, Libya, uh, which is a sort of fractious country of roughly six million people with significant, uh, at a minimum, geographical divisions, but also very important clan or tribal divisions, uh, made a bunch of choices that didn't work out well when you add in ISIS fighters coming in trying to exploit uh, ungoverned spaces or poorly governed spaces, uh, things get worse.
Oh, can Hi. I ask you a question? No, I'm, I'm asking first. Uh. <laughs> I, I'm asking Kristen. This is a test too. Um, oh. Anyway, thank you for coming to Case, and and you thank know you we for always me. we always appreciate your perspectives. M my question actually is a bit of a quiz because it goes back to some of your early work on Congress. Mm -hmm. And and forgive me if I get it wrong, but to paraphrase what you argued, Congress is less assertive when there's a clear external threat, and mm -hmm. and and it's really re requires immediate action. But it's more assertive or more assertive when when things aren't quite so bad and, and you can make some mischief about what the policy is going to be. So now it seems to, to me there's a log jam in terms of congressional either doing something or allowing someone to do something. And so what I, what I wonder is do you think that what's going on is party politics because there is not an external threat that's clear and that people can understand and articulate like between 1648 and say the end of the Cold War? Or is the problem something different where really it's, it's obstructionism in, in just you know, one party or the other trying not to see an effective policy in any area? And it, and it isn't just foreign policy. Yes. <laughs> I mean, look, it, it, when we talk about foreign policy, I mean, there, was, there was a period of time, sometime in the mid-1950s through the late 60s, maybe the 70s, uh, in which presidents had not just disproportionate influence on foreign policy, but could intimidate Congress into stepping aside. And that became increasingly less so as it moved into the 70s, uh, even into the 80s. But you still had enough members of Congress in the World War II generation who were, I think, always a little bit worried that you, know, you really should give the president the benefit of the doubt. I think in the, in the post-Cold War era, which is, again, uh, far less immediately threatening than it certainly was during the nuclear showdown with the Soviet Union, uh, a lot less deference to the president. I mean, in a whole lot of issues, it used to be the president can go on, let me, it was a uh, trade issue, an IMF issue, all these things that most Americans don't know about, in essence, go to Congress and say, I know you may not like this, but this is important for our overall foreign policy, and you can usually bring enough people uh, around. That argument really broke down in the 1990s, and it's very hard. I mean, President Clinton trying to get uh, what we now call trade promotion authority. Uh, tried to make that argument, didn't particularly move the needle very much. Uh, and I do think that uh, there's less sense that the, the executive branch has it right, but there's also a broader problem that we are in a situation in which uh, we are a long way from consensus. Uh, and uh, I, it's often described as people say the political system doesn't work. I think the political system works exactly the way it was designed. It was designed to allow people to articulate their interests and preferences. The problem is, is that we don't agree on, on what those interests or preferences should be. And so we get this logjam. And you can't detach American foreign policy from the broader context in which American politics operates. It's a very bitter time in Washington, DC. It's almost sort of like, can I say this in the great state of Ohio? Ohio State, Michigan, or Maybe you know Red Sox, Yankees, if you prefer Cubs, White Sox, if you want to go Midwest. I mean, there is a sense of people opposing things because the other side uh, is for things. And I think, you know, the days of well, the days of bipartisanship in American foreign policy were always somewhat exaggerated. I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, President Truman and President Eisenhower and President Kennedy, certainly President Johnson thought they got kicked in the shins a lot by the opposing party. Uh, I think it's very, very hard right now to get, uh, to get bipartisan agreement. And it's affected everything. I mean, as you know what very much know, Katie, just on something as simple as trying to get ambassadorial appointments through. Uh, senators now, in a way they never used to do, put a hold on them. So the president can nominate somebody, and the senator can simply uh, indicate to the Senate Majority Leader, I don't want that person voted on. And you know, originally, that, the process of a hold was, in essence, to give people time to get back to Washington, D.C. to be able to vote. And then it was you would sort of do it if there was like a great matter of principle at stake. Uh, and now it's over things like uh, the Department of Defense is not going to build the building in my district or my state, and I'm unhappy about it. Uh, and so I think this has been a real problem. And you want to talk about countries being ticked off, I and mean, a number of uh, ambassadorial appointments get held up. And I will tell you, from the countries on the other end, they don't get an ambassador. In essence, what they hear is, we do not matter. 
And you can go down and try to all you want and try to explain in Brasilia why it's nothing to do with Brazil. It's all about the way the US Senate works. Doesn't matter. What they hear is, you're telling us we don't matter because if you thought we mattered, you would make this happen. I can hear you. Hello, hello. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to comment that they clearly, uh, uh, obviously, as Professor Lavelle knows, there's a, there's a whole lot of obstruction for the sake of obstruction. Although it's it's not simply partisan. Some of it is, you know, senators exploiting things. You had Democrats doing it to uh, de Democratic administrations as well. Although a lot of it is partisan. Um, you might want to say Barcelona and Real Madrid. If you, if you, uh, if, I, if you, I, I don't do soccer. Sorry. Uh, 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 the, the two, football, not soccer. no, the, the two Belgrade uh, soccer teams <laughs> actually yeah. would be would be a really good one. Um, so there's this recent article, sort of in the Atlantic, online in the Atlantic, re revealing supposedly a great deal about the way uh, President Obama thinks about foreign policy, and it's according to this article, the basic mantra of the Obama administration, White House, is don't do stupid shit. Stuff, I believe the word was stuff. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I, I go with the more polite version. So, 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 sorry, everybody. Um, but so, so here's the question. How can you tell? How, how can you tell whether somebody is doing yeah, I mean, if you're in the administration, how, how can you tell the stupid stuff? I mean, I mean, I mean how, how, how does anybody figure that out? Okay, so Obama in April of 2014 said, don't do stupid stuff. And Hillary, uh, Secretary Clinton responded in August of 2014, don't do stupid stuff is not an organizing principle. Okay. Um, how do you, unfortunately, the only way you know is by doing. Right? History tells you whether you've chosen wisely or not wisely. I mean, if we go back, let's just think of 2003, March of 2003, actually let's go to May of 2003, uh, there were certainly a fair number of people in this country that thought that the Iraq war had been the right choice. Uh, Saddam Hussein was gone uh, and the United States had won. And it wasn't just people in Washington who thought that way, a vast majority of the American public felt that way. And if you look at uh, public opinion data over time, not only did Washington change on the wisdom of the Iraq invasion, so did the American public. Uh, people changed their mind on all of these things. I mean, I think obviously, you know, the, the, the great gift of a statesperson is they're able to figure out what the stupid stuff is and to avoid it. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there's no, if, if I had a simple recipe to give you ahead of time, uh, I would not be doing my talk right here. I, I'd, be, uh, I'd be on the consulting trail. But I, something that's important to keep in mind, that in government, it's not just what you decide to do that matters. It's what you choose not to do that matters. And sometimes we have this, uh, we have a bad tendency in our public conversation to either think, for example, think of uh, any of the major crises around, either we should have intervened with tens of thousands of troops, or we should have done absolutely nothing. Okay, there are a whole host of things you could do in between, and I think one particularly fair uh, criticism of the Obama administration in terms of Syria is that it didn't do diplomacy, that it wasn't trying to find uh, a solution to it. It really did take uh, too much of a hands-off approach, or it didn't do enough uh, to empower uh, those people who are going to overthrow Mr. Assad. Okay, so I'd like to, to follow up on one thing here. In a, in a lot of other policy theory and discussion, there's a lot of talk these days about the precautionary principle and how policy should follow the precautionary principle. Well, explain the precautionary principle. I don't understand the precautionary principle entirely, but my impression is that the notion of the precautionary principle um, doesn't fit very well with with the dynamics of foreign policy. That in foreign policy, almost anything you do is going to provoke a reaction. Uh, and, and, and things are flying around um, in, in ways that are fairly unpredictable. And so I guess my question is, 
just to follow up on the don't do stupid stuff, which was the public statement, but again, according to the article, that's not the way they phrased it in the White House. Um, is there, you know, are there any principles of wisdom in foreign policy, of caution in foreign policy? I think it's, I think it's fair to say that Obama's instincts were to be cautious. And I agree it's not a, it's not a theory, it's not a doctrine. But uh, can, can you even, is there even any way to assess risk such that, uh, so that you can tell if somebody is being cautious or not? No. <laughs> I mean, if you want to boil it down, I mean, there's, I mean, here, here's the problem. I would actually, if, if you want to read a very good book, it's a book called Thinking in Time by uh, a historian, Ernest May, and a great political science, Richard Neustadt, uh, which I think is, I'd recommend, I actually wrote a blog post. Uh, I wrote a blog called The Water's Edge, and on uh, January 20th, a year out from the administration, I, I said, these are the five books I really would like uh, the next president to read, and one of them is Thinking in Time, which is about how to use history. Because the problem is they sort of give you examples. You tell me the point you want to make. I can find a historical example to bear it out. I can show you, you know, times when rushing in was good, times when rushing in uh, was bad. And that's sort of the, the there is no sort of formulaic uh, college of engineering uh, kind of answer to that. I mean, partly these are things that are a function of, let's go back to the thing of the, of the Iraq war. From my vantage point in, in Washington, D.C. at that time, there were two schools of thought. There was one school of thought that said, this is, this is a place that, that, in essence, there's a Gordian knot. Somebody has to sever it. And if you sever it, you will, re you will release uh, these passions, the yearning to be free, and really good things will come. It's a matter of getting rid of bad people and making things happen. And there was a competing element of thought which said, uh, you're going to open a Pandora's box of things that you cannot control. And it looks like the latter group, which did not win the argument, uh, was right. Though, again, the people who would argue that the sin wasn't in the invasion, the sin was in the occupation, and that there was a failure to sort of anticipate it. And so, again, you, it's in all of these things which don't lend themselves to uh, precise measuring and analysis, like you might find. Uh, in, in a science or a, in a laboratory, you have people arguing back and forth that if you could have done something differently, you would have gotten a, uh, difficult, a different outcome. But I would say you, you can try to minimize your, your chances of, of, going, of screwing up. If you, wanted to give me, if you wanted me to give you sort of basic prescriptions, like I was writing a leadership book. OK, <laughs> let me, give me a second to call something up here if I can find it. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche once said that the most common human stupidity was forgetting the point of what you're trying to do. Okay. I would actually say that Nietzsche was slightly wrong. That's the second most common human stupidity. First most common human stupidity is the failure to figure out what you're doing in the first place. That is, governments have a tendency to do things without ever assessing what is it we're trying to accomplish. And I think advice to any candidates, any foreign policy, is then what is the end state you're trying to reach? Stephen Curry wrote a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, made millions of dollars writing it. I think the first lesson was uh, begin with the end in mind. What is the end state you're trying to reach? And oftentimes these questions don't get answered. One of my, uh, one of the sort of stories that sticks out of me from uh, the war in Iraq was, uh, no, uh, excuse me, the, uh, not war in Afghanistan, was shortly after we began bombing Afghanistan in October of 2011, uh, President Bush went and saw Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor, and in essence, he asked the following question, what are we going to do next? And I'll never forget the, the answer that uh, Rice, uh, or what Rice, uh, Secretary, then later Secretary Rice said, which is that she always hated when her boss asked her questions she hadn't thought about. <laughs> okay, so I mean the issue here, but 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 you can understand why that happens because you are in, a, you have a very busy inbox. You're trying to get things done, you know. When you are, 
maybe I saw, when I was a college professor, I had a lot more free time to sit down and think long term, let's say necessarily. And when I worked in the White House, it was mostly running back and forth from meeting to meeting. It wouldn't have big seminars to sort of talk about big issues. And that's really a problem. I think a second you know, sort of piece of advice I would give to anyone trying to make policy would be to ask yourself, don't tell me why your policy prescription will work. Tell me why it might fail. I think oftentimes we happen in, po have in policies, people say, they, they conduct what I would call the wrong comparison. What they do is they compare the weaknesses of whatever policy they hate with the strengths of whatever policy they like. And never begin to think to themselves and ask the question, how will my policy choice work out? I mean, one of my favorite, when I uh, was a college professor, uh, you know, nobody likes political action committees. Absolutely hate political action committees. It's about what's wrong in, with American domestic politics. But political action committees actually were, at the time, a reform to try to address a problem in the political system. They created a different kind of problem, not one that people were particularly focused on uh, in the beginning. So I think a second thing, besides asking, what's my end state? Where am I trying to get? Uh, is really this issue of you know, trying to anticipate what problems uh, your reform could create and how you would anticipate them. That is, in some sense, thinking strategically, thinking ahead. Um, again, I would say a third thing is what we might call the activity bias. That is the assumption that doing something is better than doing nothing. And the flip side is the non-activity bias, which is basically saying, if I stay out, it can't get any worse. Uh, it possibly can. Um, I think the other thing is the inability or difficulty to confront trade-offs. Part of, you know, when you think about campaigns, campaigns are about promising. Campaigns are people going out and saying, this is what I am going to do for you. Okay, and that's when you watch a debate, if you know something about the subject, you know right away almost all the laws of economics and policy analysis uh, sort of get thrown out the window. Okay, because in essence you're trying to communicate to people sort of the end state that you're trying uh, to create. Once you're in office, what you discover is your life is ruled by trade-offs. That is, you can get A, but if you go for A, you're not going to get B. Okay, and that's a really difficult thing uh, for a lot of people uh, to sort of admit or fess up to. And I think a lot of what happens when you're in government, again, take the issue of punishing Russia. Yes, you can punish Russia. That may come at the cost of getting Russian cooperation and other issues you need. Okay, is that the right trade-off to make? Perhaps, but sometimes we put ourselves in these binds because we're so focused on solving one problem, we're not looking at again the problems. It will go down. I have seven others, but I'm saving that for. I'm going to do like a mega blog post talking about you know my advice to the candidates. Well, one of one of the basic points of Newstat. I don't trust technology. I just well, one of the basic points that Neustadt also makes, and also that's, also that's not so much Neustadt as other policy analysts, is that you need to learn to think with a dirty mind. You know, what is going to go wrong? And that you're, you're sort of referring to that. And, and one of the interesting things in the piece in the Atlantic is that, is that Obama actually did that on Syria in terms of what would go wrong if he intervened. And he thought, that, okay, so what? Uh, 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 I, I don't want to do this. Um, but I want to uh, push you a little on... Um, this question of governing is setting priorities. Mm -hmm. So um, what priorities would you set for foreign policy uh, for the next administration? Uh, well, my immediate sort of policy is getting things right at home economically. Because I think, you know, uh, as, as my boss wrote a book called Foreign Policy Begins at Home, and I think it's quite right. Uh, there are a number of issues here uh, domestically that are important. You can't project foreign policy uh, power if your economy is deteriorating. That would be number one. I can. But number two, I think, what are the big questions? I think the big question is, how do you get uh, rising powers, particularly democratic rising powers, to want to cooperate actively with you? And I think that we have missed opportunities to build links with the Indians, with the Brazilians, with the South Africans, the Indonesians, and others. Because I think at the end of the day, uh, we live in a world in which problems increasingly cross borders. We live in the world of transnational uh, 
uh, issues. Or as I heard one state's person say to another, we used to have enemies, now all we have are problems. Okay? And, but if you want, if, if problems cross borders and you need the cooperation of others to get them done, then you had better enlist partners. Uh, and I don't think we've necessarily done as great a job as that. Second issue I worry about is the future of East Asia. Uh, the rise of China imposes, I think, some very significant uh, challenges. And you know, one of the things I'm actually right now, my job as director of studies trying to find, is somebody who's done some very good work at looking at the ability of the United States to maintain a force presence in East Asia, South, Southeast Asia, uh, given the likely trends in military technology, the fact that Chinese are building uh, their own islands in the South China Sea and uh, putting military equipment on them. But I think getting Asia right is going to be very important because it's a locus of economic and increasingly uh, political power. I think that the, the third thing is, again, the United States needs to figure out a way uh, to minimize tension, to find a more productive relationship with Russia, knowing that all along uh, this is going to be ruled by cold calculation, uh, not by uh, any sentimentality uh, about necessarily about common cause. So there's three things. Technology is sometimes difficult. Is this on? Yeah, OK. Uh, you mentioned East Asia. Um, I'm curious what you think about this. I, I term it the so-called rise of China. Uh, I don't think they're as rising as much as people tend to think they are. Um, but the dynamic of the East Asia as a region, given the um, uh, happening, happenings right now in, in Korea, uh, between North Korea, China, and Russia, uh, between South Korea saying, if you can't, uh, friends in China, rein in this nuclear threat, we're going to build our own bomb. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a uh, potential tinderbox. Uh, but at the same time, I think some of these countries um, would begin to see um, that they are more paper tigers than what we tend, what the U.S. tends Who, to sorry, think. Who's the they in that? The they? The, they? they the Chinese or the North Koreans? The, the Chinese, the North Koreans, even the Russians. Mm -hmm. I, I think they will find that they are, maybe they don't believe it, but I think that they are paper tigers when it comes to what's going on in the region in East Asia. So I'm curious if you could develop that thought a little bit, be your happy. thought, your thinking on it. I'd be happy to. Uh, on the off chance, any of the people who do Asia studies who work with me, I, I have to immediately declare I'm not an Asia expert. Don't pretend to be one. Uh, but I'll try to answer your question. So uh, number one, I, on the issue of whether China is rising, uh, I agree with you that that's far from certain. Uh, China has enjoyed unparalleled economic growth. I mean, those three decades, uh, which, in, which were made possible partly by uh, choices that the Chinese leadership made about how to retool their economy, but also because the United States was willing to allow them into the international trading system. Uh, quite impressive. Uh, but the fa fact that China has grown rapidly for three decades does not mean that it's going to continue to grow uh, or it will grow sufficiently. I mean, we can go back to everyone who's old enough. Uh, you know, it was a point where, where everyone was convinced the Soviet Union was going to pass the United States in, in when it comes to economic and military might. And I don't think anybody in 1960 or 65 or 1970 or 75 or 80 or heck even 85 are saying, you know, come the end of 1991, the Soviet Union will go out of business. Uh, so I think some skepticism about linear projections and in international relations are merited. I think with China, there, there, there is a challenge, though. And that is, it's not clear to me what's more difficult for the United States, a strong China or a weak China. Obviously, a strong China could throw its weight around in the region in ways we don't like. We've seen some of that already, quite clearly, uh, by setting uh, its territorial claims in the South China Sea, 
Uh, also, uh, the standoff with Japanese in the East China Sea. Uh, the Chinese clearly uh, have an advantage in Asia because, in some sense, that's their front yard. Uh, and they quite clearly feel it is part of their front yard and that they have a historical right uh, to be the big power in the region. I uh, would take it at face value that the Chinese really do hope over time to displace the United States as a power in that region. Uh, and I don't think they've been shy about that. Uh, on the other hand, however, you know, a China that struggles doesn't make the transition to an economy that can grow because I do think the export-led model is sort of reaching uh, its limits. And I think the Chinese economists, at least the ones I've sat at conferences, where it seem to believe the same. Uh, a China that is weak, that can't deliver on the promise of economic growth, uh, certainly in Beijing, they're going to have to present a, a, another rationale for legitimacy. That could be playing the nationalism card, uh, trying to whip. And one of the dangers about nationalism is once you whip it up, it can be very, very hard to control. Uh, and I think we've even seen in China where sometimes the government, particularly the Japanese, encourages a little bit of uh, protest and it gets a little bit more heated uh, than they want that to be. So that's a big challenge. I do think you're quite right that on, on issues that matter to us and that we think should matter to the Chinese, they haven't been terribly cooperative, quite clearly on North, North Korea. I mean, this is one of the, one of the things I, in, in the debate, what I have heard people say on both sides is that they're going to put pressure on China to bring North Korea to heel. Well, I've been in this, again, I'm not an Asia expert. Uh, I've been in the foreign policy business, but this was said during the Clinton years. It was said during the George W. Bush years. It was said in the Obama years. And the, you know, the presumption is that it is in Beijing's interest to stop North Korea. Now, either the Chinese don't read their interests the way they do, which is a, a way we do, which is a possibility. Or it's the case that China is incapable or not willing to run the risks uh, that come with trying to bring Pyongyang uh, to heel. But I do think that this is an issue that uh, the clock is running out on. Because the, for the simple reason that, well, technology doesn't always work when it comes to microphones, uh, what's happening over time here is that North Korea's nuclear program is progressing, its ballistic missile program is progressing, and the question is, how long can you live with this? In part because, uh, or one of the concerns is that you fear with this government that the normal sort of laws of deterrence will not operate. In part because this government is encouraged that notion, this government by, by which I mean in North Korea, that it will not play by, let's call it, the rules of the game. Uh, and I think that has caused a great deal of alarm, certainly in Japan, certainly in South Korea, uh, certainly uh, in the United States. Interestingly, recently, the Russians came out, uh, and I think it was uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov said that, uh, in his view, the comments coming out of Pyongyang might be justifying military action. Uh, we had the United Nations Security Council, as you know, uh, pass a resolution imposing uh, stiffer sanctions on North Korea. Among other things, now uh, member states are required to stop North Korean ships at sea or airplanes to search them for contraband and what have you. Uh, so the question is, do, do, does eventually, does the uh, government in Pyongyang say uncle and give up? Uh, and if not, then what do you do? And I think that's the challenge. And again, you know, you might say that you know, Barack Obama preferred not to intervene or be tough. I don't think that anyone would accuse George W. Bush of, of that same weakness. But the structural problem is, is that it's very hard to see how you could remove the, North Korea's nuclear ability without triggering a war uh, on the Korean Peninsula that would be quite devastating. And that's, you know, again, I, I go back to it. It's often easy when you know, you're outside of government. I always have this conversation with my friends, Democratic and Republican, because the, you know, the new administration, the ones who are going in with the new administration are all full of enthusiasm because they're going to go fix all those pro problems that the previous administration just wasn't smart enough to grasp. And then after about six months, a year, two years, I have a cough cup of coffee with them and I start saying, well, you were going to do A, B, and C. What happened to A, B, and C? Jim, you don't understand. It's complicated. Okay? 
And, 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 but I think that's really, that's really, we are stuck with a lot of issues uh, that don't have real simple solutions. And the problem is uh, you try a lot of different things and it's not clear that you can make them happen. And I would put North Korea right up there at the top of the list of things that could go uh, very, very bad. Yep. Well, I, I'll, I'll do a plug for stuff we do at, at the Council on Foreign Relations. My colleague, uh, uh, Scott Snyder, who runs our Korea Studies program, has a series of publications coming up, available on CFR.org. I'll say that again, CFR.org, uh, which actually talks about how should the United States and South Korea think about the potential for reunification. Okay, and, and one of the challenges is, is you can imagine reunification going quite well if it starts well. If it starts as a result of a bloody war, uh, that's a very, very different set of constraints. And so, you know, I, I, when you're talking about issues like North Korea, where there is a very high risk of very bad outcomes, that tends to concentrate the mind wonderfully. You know, but the, you're quite right. There is a point where maybe it'd be better to act rather than hoping the problem is going to fix itself. And I think we're we're getting closer and closer. Uh, to that decision point for the next administration, simply given what North Korea has been able to do uh, in terms of its technological capacities. I guess um, I never expected this talk to end up really being optimistic and encouraging about the situation in the world. Um, uh, I would point out. I would point out that we have heard a lot during the campaign, however, about how the problem is just that we don't have smart enough people uh, uh, involved in making policy. And I, I guess I will take, I will take the, uh, draw the conclusion that actually the problem is not smart enough people, the problem is the problem. <laughs> um, and uh, that's, that's, a, that's a general point about public policies, but certainly true in the case of foreign policy that it is, uh, there's just a lot of extremely difficult problems out there. Um, I hope you solve the easy ones. Well, actually, well, you don't solve problems. You 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 get rid of them, and they're su they're su succeeded by another problem, right? We solved the Saddam Hussein problem. It was just succeeded by a who's going to govern instead problem, and and so and so that's a that's a a, a really basic point here that um, what you have uh, in domestic policy and in foreign policy is not so much problem solution as problem succession. Uh, I am very glad that there are at least uh, some, some really smart people working and commenting on these issues and trying to bring some understanding to these issues. And uh, it has been a pleasure to have uh, Jim Lindsay here as an example uh, of uh, what the best foreign policy thinking can be. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks for coming. Jim. <laughs>